Hello, my name is Keshwani. That's K E S H W A N I, Keshwani. We are here because we want to prepare for the GMAT. We have been solving GMAT math problems out of this book here GMAT Review, the official guide, the 13th edition. If you do not own this book already, purchase one immediately. You're going to need it. The book contains 230 problem solving questions. It has 174 data sufficiency questions. We have already solved every single math problem from this book. If you're interested in watching any of the original solutions to the problems, you will find the original solutions from day number 1 through 250. Right now we are in the process of redoing the problems and we are on page number 288. Please turn to it. Page number 288, problem number 143. Here's the problem. We are told that we are going to deposit $120 on the 15th of each month, beginning with January, for n number of years, n number, n number of months, n months of the year. We are not told how many months, just some numbers, some months in the year. After, after that period, after, make, after having made the deposit of $120 on the 15th of every month, at some point in the year, we make a switch. We make a switch to withdrawing the amount. And then we begin to withdraw $50. $50 each month on the 15th of the month for the remainder of the year. Since we made a deposit for n months, the remainder of the year would be 12 minus n months. We are also told that the balance on May 31st was exactly $2,600. And most importantly, we are told that there are no other transactions taking place in this account other than this one transaction every month on the 15th of the month in the beginning of the year for first few months a deposit is being made on the 15th of each month of, in the amount of $120 and then at some point we make a switch from making a deposit to making a withdrawal of $50 on the 15th of every month. That's all. The question is very straightforward, very simple. The question simply is what is the range of the balance in this account? That's all. Let's see what they tell us. Let's see what they tell us. In the first statement, in statement number one, we are told that the balance balance on on April 30th was less than $2,625. We are told that the balance on April 30th was less than $2,625. Let's see what we can do with it. So here's our April 30th. Here's our May 31st. And we know on May 31st we have $2,600. We are told that. That's $2,600 per exactly. And that is given to us. We put a box around it. That information is given to us. That cannot be altered. On April 30th we are told that the amount that, that we had was less than $2,625. We are not told exactly how much amount. All we are told is that it is less than $2,625. Question is, what happens between April 30th and May 31st? Between that period, time period, during that time period, but from April 30th to May 31st, exactly one transaction is going to take place on the 15th of the month, on May 15th. The question is, that transaction that took place, was it a withdrawal or was it a Deposit. Let's find out, shall we? We know that we had less than twenty-six hundred dollars, twenty-six twenty-five, less than twenty-six twenty-five on April thirtieth. If we had made a, if we had made a withdrawal, if we had made a withdrawal on May fifteenth, remember withdrawals are in the amount of fifty dollars, deposits are in the amount of one hundred twenty dollars. If we had made a withdrawal on May fifteenth, we would have ended up, we would have ended up with two thousand five hundred and seventy-five dollars, less than that. We would have ended up with less than $2,575, less than $2,575 on May 15th. And since no other transaction took place between May 15th and May 31st, between no, no transaction took place between May 15th and May 31st, this tells us that we would have ended up with less than $2,575 on May 15th, but we are told that we have, we have $2,600 on May 31st. That tells us that we could not have possibly, we could not have possibly made a withdrawal. We must have made a deposit on May 15th. We must have made a deposit on May 15th. 
a deposit was made on May 15th. Let's make a note of it. On May 15th, a deposit was made. Deposit was made on May 15th. But the question here is, for how long does this deposit continue? Was this was that the last deposit that was made in the account, and after that did we start withdrawing the amount, or did we make deposit for a few more months? Because in the beginning of the year we are told that we keep making deposits on the 15th of each month and at some point we make a switch from making a deposit to, to making a withdrawal. Where does, that, where, does that, where does that transition take place from making a deposit to making a withdrawal? All this tells us is that we know now for a fact, we know for a fact that we made a deposit on the 15th of May. But did we make more deposit or was that the last deposit? There is no way to tell here. And without knowing that part, without knowing that information as to where the transi transition takes place between the deposit and the withdrawal, we cannot figure out the range of balance in this account. The first statement provides us information that is not worthless, but it is not sufficient. The first statement provides us information that is not sufficient. First, first statement is not sufficient. A, D. B, C, E. Now that we know that the first statement by itself is not sufficient, we know now that the answer cannot be A or D. It would have to be either B, C or E. Let's see what they tell us in the second statement. We have to get rid of everything. We cannot leave everything from the first statement. We have to get rid of it. In the second statement, In the second statement, they tell us that the balance on June 30th, the balance on June 30th, we are told, was less than $2,625. Less than $2,600. Same analysis as before. Nothing is going to change. Same thinking, same logic, same application, same analysis, as I said. On May 31st, we know for a fact, on May 31st, we know for a fact that we have $2,600. That is given to us. There is no doubt about it. That is given to us. We also know now that on June 30th, we have less than $2,625. Well, think about it for a second. Between May 31st and the June 30th, again, only one transaction took place precisely on the 15th of the month on the 15th of June. Was that transaction a withdrawal or was it a deposit? Well, since we started out with $2,600, if we had made a deposit, if we had made a deposit, we have 2,000, let's switch this thing so this one is closer to this thing so we can point to it very easily. Deposit and withdrawal. If we had made a deposit, we know we have $2,600 on May 31st. If we had made a deposit, on the 15th of June, we would have had $2,720 because deposits are made in the amount of $120. And if we had $2,720 on June 15th as a result of having made, the, having made the deposit of $120 on June 15th, our balance would have been $2,720. And since nothing happened between June 15th and June 30th, we could not have possibly had a balance of less than $2,625 in the account on June 30th. It is impossible. The fact that we have a balance of 2,600 here and something less than 2,625, that tells us that a withdrawal, a withdrawal, a withdrawal must have been made on June 15th. We could not have made a deposit. Let's make a note of it. On June 15th, this should say 15th, not 31st, May 15th. A withdrawal was made. A withdrawal was made. And this this part came from statement number two, and this part came from statement number one. Again, the same problem as before. Now we know for a fact that the withdrawal was made on June 15th, but second statement by itself does not tell us where the withdrawal began. Was that the first withdrawal? Or were there a few more withdrawals in the past? Where did, the, where, where did we start withdrawing the amount from the account? In theory, we could have started withdrawing the amount from, amount from the account from the, from the 15th of February. Because we know, we are told that we made first, for the first few months we made the deposit. The first few months in theory could be just one month or two months. 
Where did we start to make a withdrawal? Again, where did the transition take place between making a deposit every month of $120 on the 15th of the month to making a withdrawal of $50 on the 15th of every month? We cannot tell from the second statement by itself. Second statement by itself is not enough. We know answer cannot be A, B, B, C, E. So first we found that the first statement by itself was not enough. We knew that the answer could not have been A or D. Now we find out that the second statement by itself is also not enough. Answer cannot be B. Let's put them together, shall we? Let's put them together. Let's put the two, information, two bits of information together. So when we put them together, when we put them together, 1 and 2, when we put them together, we know now, here's our April 30th, there's our May 31st, on May 31st we have $2,600, on June 30th, we know now that on 15th of, on the 15th of June, we made a withdrawal. We also know that on 15th of May, we made a deposit. That's it, that's enough. Now we can figure out our range, because now we know for a fact that that was the last deposit, that was the first withdrawal. Finding our range is very simple. $2,600 were in the account. Now, the part that we are about to do actually in the real exam would be a sheer waste of time. Do you understand? So we can stop right now. We are done with the, as far as the problem is concerned, as far as the exam is concerned, we are, good, we are done. If we know this was the last deposit and that was the first withdrawal, it's just a matter of calculation and we can figure out the range as to what was the lowest balance in the account and what was the highest balance in the account. We can very easily do that here. Therefore, the answer is C. So what we are about to do actually is not something we'll do in the real exam. We're just doing it out of curiosity. So, so here we go. So if we had $2,600 on May 31st, but that amount is a result of the amount that we started out within the account plus the deposit we made. How many deposits did we make? Let's count them. January 15th, February 15th, March 15th, April 15th, and May 15th. We made five deposits in order to get to here, May 31st. Five deposits were made in the amount of in the amount of $120. We know 120, we know 120 times 10, 120 times 10 is 1200, therefore 120 times 5 would have to be 600, which means this amount that we see is a result of having made $600 with a deposit in the account in addition to what we started out with, which means we must have begun, we must have begun our account on January 1st, on January 1st, we must have had $2,000 in the account. On May 31st, we have $2,600 in the account. That's our range. And I'll show you in a second why that's the range. Because after that, after that, we begin to make a withdrawal. If we made five deposits, we must have made seven withdrawals. Seven withdrawals beginning with June 15th. June 15th, July 15th. August 15, September 15, October 15, November 15, and December 15. Seven withdrawals. Seven withdrawals times 50, we made $350 in withdrawals. So by December 31st, we end up with the amount that we have here, $2,600 on May 31st, minus seven withdrawals of $50 each which is $2,600 minus $350, it is $2,250. $2,250. In, in so that's, that's it. These are, these are the three markers from January 1st, December 31st to May 31st. These are the three markers we have. And the range simply means what was the highest balance we had in the account, what was the highest balance we had in the account, and what was the low, lowest balance we had in the account. Well, the lowest balance we had in the account is right here. $2,000 on January 1st. January 1st, the amount that we started out was our lowest balance in the account. After that, we began to make a deposit. And as a result, it went up all the way up to $2,600. Therefore, the range that we're looking for is $600. Because after that, we begin to make a withdrawal, it goes down again. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Or should we do one more problem? I'm not sure.
What the hell? Let's do one more. Let's do, let's do 338. We are done with this question. Just give me a second here and we'll do one more. All right, here we go. 144. 144 very quickly. Are all numbers in the list of 15 numbers equal? So apparently we are, we are told that we have a list of 15 numbers in our hand. The question is are all of those numbers equal without having been told anything at all about the numbers themselves. Let's see what they tell us in the first statement. In the first statement they tell us that the sum of these numbers, the sum of these numbers is 60. Do you suppose simply knowing that the sum of the 15 numbers, if I come up to you and I tell you that I have in my hand a list of 15 numbers and I'm telling you that when you add them up they add up to 60. Will that be enough for you to be able to tell me if these numbers that I'm holding in my hand are all equal? Of course not. That's silly. There's no way to tell if the numbers are all, numbers are all equal or not by simply knowing the fact that they all add up to 60. The first statement is not enough. A, D, B, C, E. First statement is not enough. Now that we established that the first statement by itself is not enough, we know now answer cannot be A or D. Let's look at second statement. Second statement tells us that sum of any three numbers sum of any three numbers any three numbers equals 12 sum of any three numbers equals 12 in other words I have 12 numbers in the bag and I close my eyes I close my eyes and I pick three numbers out of the bag the bag contains the bag contains 15 numbers and I do, I do the trial several times. Each time I close my eyes, I pick three numbers at random and I keep finding out that they always add up to 12. What do you suppose that what's going on here? Well, if sum of any three numbers, any three numbers picked at random is always 12, that implies, that implies they must, they must, they must all they must they must all be 4. They must all be 4. That's the only way. That is the only way that you can keep picking up three numbers at random and they always add up to 12. Otherwise it is impossible. Do you understand? Otherwise it is not going to happen. They will not add up to 12 uh, if they were all different because if they were all different, if there are 15 numbers and they add up to 60, the only way they add up to 60 is if some of them are more than, but well now, we, now, we, now we're getting into nitty gritty, they will all have to be 4. They will all have to be 4, otherwise, they will, otherwise it will not work. The statistics tells us that if you're going to pick 3 numbers at random out of, the, out of the list of 15 numbers, and they're always 12, the only way that is possible is that they are all 4. The answer choice is B here. Second statement by itself does the job. Yeah, the answer is good. I'll see you tomorrow, okay? Bye now.